So good morning, everyone. And uh, it's really a joy and privilege to be here. And uh, many of you today, uh, you know, being a Saturday, today being a holiday, could have been in many places. But uh, really good to see each one of you here. And I'm sure, uh, you know, we will have a very good time of interacting with each other, getting to know new friends, and also, uh, you know, we will have something to take away at the end of the day and be a better person at our workplace, you know, and then we will have a lot of takeaways from today, hopefully. Uh, I want to thank also, you know, uh, Pastor Ashish, uh, the entire Christian professionals team for giving me this opportunity to share here. And um, I hope, uh, you know, I'll be able to share some of my life experiences and what I have learned, what God has taught me during my, you know, uh, journey in my professional life. And, uh, you know, it's not to, uh, uh, you know, promote or elevate myself, but I just want to share some of things, you know, which could be an encouragement, you know, for most of you. And, uh, you know, the theme of today, as you all would have seen, it's about, you know, how do you arise and how do you shine at workplace? You know, I mean, I was just looking at the poster. It said, how can we stand up, stand tall, get ready for actions? And how can we shine by doing our work well and release what we have, right? Now, I, I, I want to share some simple thoughts for both the aspects. How do you arise? How do you shine at your workplace? Uh, you know, I also want to share, you know, some of the things, like I said, what has worked for me and what has God taught me in those journeys? It is not that something I knew it in the beginning, but then, you know, when you look back in your life, many a times, you know, you get to know, what, you know, what God taught you at a particular time. You know, many times it may even be a difficult thing, but then later you know that why you had to go through certain things and so on. Now, when I look at the word arise in the Bible, you know, I was taught, I mean, I was reminded of two occasions. I will just read Matthew 9, 6 where Jesus said to a paralyzed man, he said that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Right? Here Jesus is telling to a paralyzed man, arise. Then secondly, in Luke seven fourteen, then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise, right? If you look at these two scriptures, right? In one case, there was a paralyzed man. In one case, there was a dead person, right? And Jesus said, arise. And in both those cases, they came out of the situation, whatever they were in, right? And why I want to share these two instances is that Many a times in our professional life, right, we feel maybe we are paralyzed. Maybe we are stuck. Or sometimes, you know, even if you work for, let's say, a few years, we even feel that, okay, we are dead. Now, we don't know what's going to happen next, right? But then, what I want to really share here is that God wants us to, you know, if you're struggling with a challenge, God wants us to, you know, arise, you know, come out of that if you're paralyzed, if you are in a situation that you feel that there is no hope, God wants us actually to come up. Now, I, I want to share, you know, to start with, I want to share one story, you know, from my childhood, which is actually played a huge role in my entire professional life, right? I just wanted to share it, you know, maybe I'll spend some time sharing that because that story, you know, that Im, you know, impacted my entire professional life. You know, I may be working for 20 plus years now, but that story had the beginning and that story had the most impact in my life. Now, I come from a small town called Sivakasi, yeah, which is normally famous for uh, manufacturing crackers. Yeah, so whenever I say Sivakasi, everyone knows that it's famous for crackers and so on. Uh, I come from a non-Christian family. Yeah, my father was from non-Christian faith. My mother came to faith uh, as a first person in the family, but my mother was not allowed to go to church and so on. She was a homemaker. My dad had some business. My mother was not allowed to go to church and so on in, in, in a setup like where I was brought up. So my mother would only know whatever she read. 
yeah, uh, with, the, with, with, with her Bible or with the, some magazine she used to get from someone else and so on. So she used to teach us right from our childhood uh, about Christian values and Christian faith. But then as children, we always said both the things, right? Your dad would say one thing, your mom would say one thing, right? That's how I grew up. Now, I studied in a government school, yeah, because that's the most popular school, you know, in small places. You will not have many schools those days. And that was one of the popular school I studied over there. And one struggle I had right from my childhood, right? Right from the time that I was maybe, when I started to speak, right from the time, the three, four onwards, I always used to have a struggle with stammering, right? So right from, let's say, when you go to LKG, KG, you know, whatever you study, right? You know, first standard and so on, all the kids will bully you, right? Imagine you want to start saying something, I, you know, because teachers will ask you a question, so they will ask you, okay, can everybody read one paragraph each? Now, when the turn comes to me, I would stammer so much that, I, you know, the teachers will often say, okay, let's pass, right? I mean, you sit, let the next person read. Now, this was a struggle I had right from, you know, throughout my, uh, you know, till my 12th standard or so, and it was, it was going on, and I also got used to living with it, you know, so it was after a point, I thought, okay, you know, you stammer, so what? You somehow get used to the whole thing, right? And it did not impact, you know, with respect, I got used to getting bullied. You know, if someone make, you know, when you start to say something, if you say, you know, if you start stammering, then, you know, you got, and basically I got used to it. Now, I went to Coimbatore uh, for my engineering. So I finished my 12th standard until that in my, in my hometown, and I went to do engineering. Now, when I went to engineering, I also, you know, by the grace of God, I got saved in the final year, yeah? And I, I mean, because there was a church near our college, and then, you know, I just inquired something, and then there was somebody who kept following up with me, then I, you know, eventually I started going to church and I got saved. But that's a different story. But what I wanted to say is that I did not, you know, I still had the struggle throughout my engineering with stammering, right? Now, in the, in, the, in the engineering, they will ask you maybe, you know, to share something. You know, you take a small, uh, you know, maybe you, you, you take a subject and you teach it to the class. You know, all of us do such, you know, such presentations and so on. But I had always, you know, the option to pass, right? I, I would say, oh, I use, you know, I stammer, so I won't get into that, right? So I always had that. Now, my mother also taught me, you know, one simple prayer, yeah? She always used to tell me, okay, whatever you prepare, don't rest on that. Always ask God, you know, to help you. So one prayer I always used to pray every, you know, before every exam is that, God, I prepared everything, but you hold my hands and you write the exam for me. I'm not dependent on my preparation. So by the grace of God, right, I had very good marks in the, you know, I, I, I got a university rank and so on. I still want to come to the main story, but I did not know much from the Bible those days. You know, although I got saved in my final year, I knew only three things in the Bible, Psalm 23, Psalm 91, and Psalm 51, right? So Psalm 23 on a normal day, uh, Psalm 91 on a difficult day, Psalm 51 when you do something wrong. Right? So, I mean, I, actually, I did not know, right? I only had a Tamil Bible. I, I, you know, I, I just started going to church only in the final year. Until then, I, I never went to a Sunday school. I never had any exposure, you know, to learning the Bible or so on. Now, why I'm sharing this is that in the engineering college, right? So, you, you had good marks. You had all that. Now, in the final year, campus placements start to happen. Right? So companies are coming to interview you. Now, what happens, you know, I mean, I remember in those days, in the, in the 99, 2000, you know, everybody was easily getting placed because there were two things happening in the world. One was the Y2K problem. Yeah, so everybody was hired. Uh, you know, they wanted to solve in the mainframe the Y2K, the year 2000 problem. Or there were a lot of dot-com companies coming up, right? I mean, you had everything dot-com for that, dot-com for this, and so on. Now, I started attending campus interviews, right? So imagine you have good marks. So everybody in your class expects that, okay, you will get placed, 
right? Because everyone knows that, okay, this guy has good marks and so on. Now, the first company came. I did not get placed. The second company came. The main reason was that I will go to the interview and I will start to stammer, right? So when you are interviewing 10 people in college, uh, normally if you are the interviewer, you will go, you will play safe, right? Why, when we have 10 options, why do you hire a guy who is not talking properly, you know, stammering a lot? And this happened for nine companies, right? Almost 30% of my college got placed, but I was not placed, right? And uh, you also feel ashamed, right? Everybody, oh, you have good marks. Uh, and then in your class, everybody got placed, but then you are not getting placed. Now, I did not know what to do, yeah? So I thought, I made up, right? I mean, normally, a lot of companies used to do, uh, you know, the aptitude test and interview, but this company even had a group discussion. So I did stammer as usual, and I went for the interview. Now, they said they, they, they've selected three people, but then they called me once again, right? So, you know, like specially freshers as a pool, right? And then they allocate them to different departments, right? Different projects and so on. Now, this company had an education division also, right? And six people out of the pool, 100 or so they hired, they assigned them to the education division of the you know, company which offers corporate training, right? So for example, I remember those days, there used to be uh, Microsoft uh, certified or Cisco certified. I mean, now a lot of, you know, like you would have heard about a lot, lot, you know, lot many people do, but in the 2000 and so on, it was very rare, right? So not many you will find Cisco certified. Now what we were all asked to do is that, learn the technology, learn it hands-on, and you are supposed to deliver this training to corporate companies, right? So imagine, so you know, my background, so I was struggling with talking normally. I remember my engineering viva, the external uh, examiner told me that it's okay, you don't have to speak. You know, he saw me doing stammering so much, he said, it's okay, you sit. And then, you know, he gave me full marks, right? Because he thought, this person, why oh, I necessarily trouble him? But now I am put into the education division of this company, and I have to conduct corporate trainings, right? Now, I, I, I went to the HR, and I told them, see, why I should not be for this job? Why I am not made for this job? Now, the, the HR told me, see, we do a random assignment. Now, if you change one, many people like you will come and say, change me into that and this and that. So it's not possible. You have to live with it. Now, that's where, again, Right? I did not know what to do, right? As I said, I do know, you know, I only had a Tamil Bible. I do know to ask God, but I did not know anything beyond that. Right? So I asked my mother. So my mother told me, do you know in the Bible, there is a guy called Moses, and Moses told that, you know, when God asked Moses to lead, Moses said, you know, I am not the one to speak God. I don't speak well. Actually, he says, you know, like if you see in KJV, he says, I'm, I'm of slow of speech, right? And he said to God, you send my brother, not me, right? Now, I did not know that this is Exodus 4, 10 to 12, right? I know only that it is in page number 73, right? Because it was difficult for me in Tamil Bible where to see and so on because it was Yatra Hamam. And I, I, I did not know that, right? I thought it's page number 73. You know, I think the day before yesterday, we were looking at that Bible. So what I used to do is that I used to put my finger and then say, God, if you did it for Moses, you know, you can do it for me. I did not know speaking the word of God. I did not know what is faith, right? All I knew is that my mother told me that scripture, and I was in a desperate situation because my whole induction was conducting mock trainings, right? Imagine I, I made a fool of myself many times going and presenting something and then, you know, people will laugh at me, right? What is this guy trying to do? I remember I used to pray that scripture day and night. Every day I used to say, God, if you did it for Moses, you can do it for me. In, if you created, you know, because, you know, the, the, the scripture says, but Moses said to the Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. 
Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So I always used to say, God, you shall be with me. You shall teach me what I should speak. Right? Now, I'll come to that why I'm sharing all these details, you know, but this particular aspect really helped me at the end. I remember the first ever mock training after I started praying when I delivered. Those other five people in my team, they were saying, hey, what happened to you today? You started speaking, right? And what I wanted to really share is that that actually, you know, touched me that God's word works, right? Because I, I, I did not understand anything at all. You know, I, I did not know. Like I said, I've never been to a Sunday school. I don't know Christian songs. I don't know anything. But when that incident happened, right, I said, God, you know, you have helped me to overcome it. And first year, right? I mean, I, I was there in the job for maybe one year or so, one, one and a half years. And the entire year, whatever training that I conducted, you know, God, you know, gave me a good feedback. I always used to, re you know, receive excellent feedback in the way I, I, I delivered those trainings. Why I am sharing this here is that, see, many a times, we may be in a profession where we don't like the job. Now, when I came fresh out of college, I did not like that job, right? Because I thought, why should everybody is programming? Why, you know, I, I studied computer science. Why should I teach something about technology to someone else? I want to do programming. I want to do hands-on things, right? But then had it not been for that one year that I had to go through difficulty, like what I did in my schooling, what I did in my engineering, I would have never, ever overcome that challenge of stammering, right? So what I basically, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's nice to say 20 years later that that job, God did, the, you know, did this and that, but I had all my struggle. You know, I remember I used to even cry. You know, I used to say, God, why this job? I want to get out of this job. I don't want to do this job at all. But if I look back now after several years, right, had it not been for that job, I would have never overcome my stammering, right? And today, if you see, you know, I'm not saying, you know, my, my job involves only talking, right? I mean, my, my, my wife always says, why are you talking so loudly? You know, now we work from home, right? From morning till evening, you are just so loud, right? So, the jo you know, like, I, and then, I, you know, God has taken me to so many places where I have to deliver something technical, you know, our, our technology-related stuff, our product-related stuff, where I have to educate people from other countries and so on. So why I'm saying this is that when you have a challenge, God trains you professionally, right? God actually trains you professionally to overcome your challenges. And as long as we are committed to God and his ways, he will make all things, you know, work together for good. Never, ever give up on God's word and his promises. Um, I think. Maybe next slide, yeah. So never ever give up on God's word and his promises. Now, from that day until today, right, one thing God has taught me is that any job assignment that I get, right, I always think that, if you can, yeah, we can stay there, Joshua. What I've always re realized is that every assignment that you have at workplace God is actually teaching you something, right? God is actually dealing with you to overcome something, right? So I really want to encourage, maybe we take a moment, one minute, you know, just write down in the notebook, whatever you have, what is that one personal challenge that you are struggling with, right? It could be a professional challenge. Maybe you're not growing, maybe you are not uh, able to learn something new, or maybe you have a problem with some aspects of your workplace, right? The reason I'm saying write down for yourself is that, you know, there is always a promise, you know, which you can take, right? And ask God for help. And I'm sure God will help. So like I said, I did not know anything at all when I prayed those prayers, right? I, had no, I only knew page number 73, 
I did not even know that it was Exodus chapter 4. But God knows your situation, and God always helps you to overcome that challenge. Yeah, maybe we take a minute, just write down that challenge, and I'm sure when you go back home, uh, write down a scripture and stand on it, and I'm sure God will help you. Okay, uh, the second thing I want to talk about, you know, okay, you rise over your personal challenges, you know, for God. Second thing I want to talk about is that our identity, right? Uh, if you look at in the world, our identity is always defined based on our profession, right? So you see that they say so-and-so is a doctor, so-and-so is a homemaker, so-and-so is a, let's say, is a teacher, so-and-so is a lawyer, or he is a software engineer, or she is a, a consultant, and so on. But, you know, we need to ask ourselves, whom do we think we are? Whom does God think we are, right? Now, I want to read Matthew 18, uh, 1 to 5, um, where Jesus is talking to his disciples, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, little child to him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Now, what is the identity of a child? So imagine, let's say you are going to get a passport for a child. Uh, what does the passport company, you know, in a, I mean, the passport department of the country say? You will issue a passport, but the passport works as long as the child is a minor only with one of the parent, right? So the identity of the child is only the identity of the parent, right? So that's how a minor child passport is issued. What I want to mainly say here is that, like a child, do we find our identity in our parent, that is our God, right? Because Bible says we are called to be his children, and we are called, you know, I mean, God has given us the spirit of Abba. You know, we can call him Abba Father. Why I want to mainly share is that our identity is not our profession. You know, I mean, our, our, our identity is not our profession. Our identity is that we are children of God, right? Now, why I want to say this is that a lot of times, you know, after a point in your career, right, we may feel insecure, Right? We may feel, okay, how can I hold on to this job? How can I, you know, how can I get a promotion? Then how can I hold, get hold on to that promotion? I can get a responsibility for a position, then I start worrying about how can I hold on to that position, right? But what is important here to understand is that our identity is not our profession. Our identity is we are children of God, right? Now, once this truth becomes a reality, then your approach towards your professional life will be entirely different, right? Now, it is not easy to make this thought a reality because it is very challenging, right? I mean, the world is so competitive. You see competition. You see people around you doing a lot of different things. But it is important that, I mean, for me personally, it took some time to make it a reality, you know? Uh, the moment it became a reality, my aspect towards any position any role that you play has completely changed because, you know, your security is in the Lord, not in your job or not in the company that has offered you a job, right? So what I wanted to say, the two things what we saw so far is that for you to arise, right, God's word and God can help you 
to overcome those personal challenges. Secondly, to be, you know, to, to, to rise up, we need to be aware of our identity, right? Our identity is that we are God's children. That's the only identity, right? There is no other identity. We, I know we can be a software engineer, you can have a designation, you can have this position, but all that is okay. But the first and foremost identity, the, the only identity, you know, in the kingdom of God is we are God's children, right? Now, having seen that, let's move on. Uh, I wanted to talk about two more aspects. Um, now, when we talk about shining, right? So all of us want to shine, right? At workplace, there is always a talk about, okay, how can you build your brand? How can you uh, market yourself? How can you grow? What can you do? I mean, there are, you know, like, I mean, like, especially nowadays you see in the social media, even when you attend one particular course, people say, oh, I have got this certificate. I've got that certificate. Then there are 100 people liking it and commenting about it. You know, the whole world is going in a different direction. But here, for us, what exactly, as a Christian professional, what exactly God wants us to do? I want to read 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making his appeal through us. We, as Christ's representatives, plead with you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Now, it says that you are his representative, you are his ambassador. Now, how will we behave at the workplace if we know that we are ambassadors of Christ, right? I mean, imagine, will we be complaining about the workplace or we will be setting the standards at the workplace if you know that we are ambassadors of Christ, and it says you are Christ's representative. Now, I want to talk about two biblical aspects, important aspects that are relevant for, you know, shining at workplace. One is diligence. The second is excellence, right? So we can take a stand, we can do this, that. But the thing is that if you are diligent and if you are excellent, in all that you do, and give all the glory to God, and, and also depend on God for those two, these two aspects, you know, God will surely, surely promote you. God will surely, surely, you know, I mean, so there are scriptures we will see. God will, you know, make you stand in front of, you know, kings and queens. That's what the Bible says. When you're diligent, when you work hard, when you are also excellent in what you do. Uh, I mean, the word diligence itself, you know, means careful, are persistent work. I mean, hard work is simply working hard, but diligence could be in also that working hard in the right direction. Now, a diligent person is normally a reliable person. Diligence can be applied in our spiritual life also. You know, we can ask ourselves, do we diligently obey God's commandments? You know, I mean, it is, it is you know, the word diligence. Do we diligently obey? If you diligently obey the voice of God, he will set you high above all the high places, you know, Deuteronomy. You can think about Joseph, right? I mean, we, have, we, have, we know a lot of stories from the Bible. Joseph, you know, was diligent even when he was sold as a slave and he had to work as a slave, right? I mean, that's what saw him rise up, right? Now, his brothers sold him, but the thing is that Joseph was diligent even as a slave, right? And you know the story, how God actually raised him up. Now, I want to see some scriptures. If you see, uh, Proverbs talks about diligence a lot. I've taken some scriptures. Diligent hands will rule. All hard work brings a profit. The desires of diligent are fully satisfied. Right? Now, how can we be diligent? Because that's also a question, right? So how can we be diligent at workplace? Uh, again, I want to talk about three things for this. One is that be faithful in every little thing that you do, right? So you see a lot of people, I mean, we only see people after they have achieved something, but if you really look back in their lives, right, how faithful they were in their little things, right? I mean, King David, how, as a shepherd David, how diligent he was. So Joe, I know David's brothers were in the army, but God had... But God's eyes, it meant more than the success of David's brothers who were in the army. God looked at David, right? I mean, David is the only person we see that, you know, man after God's own heart. And David faithfully 
and diligently performed his minor duties, which actually, you know, made him, you know, went on to become a king of Israel, and he was able to rule the king, you know, the entire kingdom with diligence, uh, you know, with the, what he has learned as a shepherd, right? Because he had, as a king, he had the responsibility to take care of the people. Now, there are a lot of things, right? I mean, we can say that, oh, I am unemployed. How can I be diligent? You know, someone told me this some time back. Okay, if you're unemployed, are you working hard to find a job, right? So what I'm trying to say is that a diligence can be applied in any situation, right? Or if you're working on a small thing, how diligent are you, right? How, how much effort you're putting in? So be faithful in everything because Bible says, Jesus himself said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So when we are faithful in little things, God sees that, right? And a lot of people, you know, you, you know, we will see, a lot of people do not give attention to the little things, right? Little details. But at work, there are very few people who will do that, right? And God honors that. Secondly, work sincerely, right? I mean, Proverbs 6, uh, we talk, you know, the, the Bible talks about ants, right? It says, go and learn from the ants. So the ants don't need supervision. They overcome roadblocks. They work hard. They always are busy, never lazy, right? They're saving it up for future, right? Whatever, I mean, you see the, uh, how, you know, you observe really, you know, I mean, the Bible says, go to the ant, you sluggard. That's what the word used, right? I didn't want to use that word. But what I'm saying is that, you, you know, Bible says that go and observe and how hard they are working, right? And we need to ask ourselves that are we doing that, right? And thirdly, I also want to talk about removing distractions. See, when you do a Google search the, with the word distraction, right, and put image Google search, the only results you get are social media images, right? I mean, I just did Google search image, put the word distraction, the only result you get is social media. See, while social media is very good for learning for many aspects, you know, I mean, I do learn a lot uh, from many of those aspects, but we need to really see, is it something distracting or is it something, you know, really making you grow, right? So one example, see, what I always do is that, be it in church or be it in office, I only take notes with my notebook and pen, right? So when I'm talking to someone, if they say these are the topics, I write it down. Then I also will ensure that, you know, when, when I have the next meeting with that person, I will always go back to that notes and say, last time when we spoke, this is what we spoke, and this time we do this and that, right? Why I'm sharing that is that many a times when we use a paper and a pen, you only have a paper and a pen and you. But when you have taken notes in a phone, I'm not saying that we should, technology is very advanced, we should use it. But when you take notes in one application, the other application sends you a notification that somebody else has sent you something, right? And then, I mean, the whole thing, it can, you know, the whole thing can be taken for a ride, right? You can just move on from one to other. Then you may even forget why you actually opened the whole device, right? That's what is happening to many people. So there is time for everything, but if any of thing, these kind of things is distracting you, it is really better to cut away from it, right? That's what Bible says. So three things, be faithful in every little thing, Work sincerely. Thirdly, remove distractions. Secondly, I want to also talk about, you know, when we, we talked about diligence, secondly, I want to talk about excellence. Uh, the excellence, you know, the quality, you know, how, how can you be outstanding? How can you be extremely good, right? See, it's not for proving something that, you know, to prove, you know, to get a success or anything that you need to behave like that. It's again a biblical aspect, right? Diligent and excellence, what we are seeing, is from the Bible. Now, you need not be the best employee at your company, but are you giving your best, right? So a lot of times we need to ask that question to ourselves. Are we doing our best? Are we giving our 100%? Now, Bible says, do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. See, a lot of us may want to stand before kings, but then 
Is it something, you know, is it God asking us to, you know, I mean, God putting us there? And if you excel in your work, right, God can take you there. Now, an excellent person exceeds the requirements, right? An excellent person always goes the extra mile. An excellent person will do more than enough. And excellence is an attitude, right? And when I say excellence, maybe I just want to ask this question. When I say excellence, what brands come to your mind? Apple, Apple OK. Nike, OK, Nike. Tata, OK. Toyota, OK. Now, all of you know, every brand that is mentioned here, you know, you know, if you're, you know, maybe if you take Apple as an example, right? Now, Apple did not invent smartphones. There were smartphones before iPhone came. There were tablets before iPad came. There were MP3 devices or musical, you know, I mean, the, like, um, like iPods. Before iPod came, there were. But what Apple did is that they did an excellence in the way you interact with those devices. Right? I mean, they invented something. And today, if you see, I mean, they also make you like that, that once you start using the device, you don't want to use anything else. Right? Because they have the excellence in, you know, they have simplicity in their usability. You know, the way you use everything is intuitive. And the operating system is robust. So, I mean, we can talk about that. And same thing, you know, somebody said Toyota, somebody said Tata. So every of these brands have certain reasons, right, for being excellent and being standing out. Now, you know, we need to really see that are we being that excellent person at our workplace, right? And excellence can be developed over a period of time, right? Anything that we do, are we doing excellently, right? And, um, you know, I mean, I want to also mention another character, Daniel, right? Now, Daniel 6 says, Daniel was, you know, preferred above the presidents and princes because he of an excellent spirit was in him, yeah, and the king found it good, right? I mean, actually, if you see, Daniel had to deal with three, three regimes, right? So kings came, kings went. But Daniel was always number two in all those regimes. In other words, if you are excellent, it does not matter who's your boss. Your bosses may come, bosses may go, right? As long as you are excellent, right, you will always be able to stand out right, and bring glory to God. Now, all this, what I'm trying to share here is that it's not that you try to be excellent for proving a point and so on. It is a biblical aspect, right? I mean, you can learn a lot from Daniel. You can learn a lot from, you know, like many characters from the Bible, how, you know, excellence played a role in those biblical characters. Now, I want to say, how do you develop excellence, right? Uh, maybe if you go to the next slide, three things again, consistency, discipline, and continuous learning, right? So excellence can be developed through consistency, discipline, and continuous learning. Now, take our, our life for, as an example, our personal life as an example. Let's talk about some simple habits. Let's say I will sleep seven to eight hours a day. I will exercise 30 minutes a day. I will meditate the word of God first thing in the morning. I will journal for five minutes, right? Just take for personal life, right? You, you just say these four things. You will sleep well. You will exercise every day for 30 minutes. You will meditate the word of God first thing. You will actually journal, right? Now, if you do this, let's say, for one full year, imagine the impact you will have, right? See, it all looks simple. But the thing is that in workplace also, if you are learning something, even if you learn, if you spend 15 minutes to learn one thing in a day, right? But if you do that 15 minutes every day, imagine at the end of one year what you would have learned, right? So that's what it is always talked about, that seemingly small steps that we take consistently will actually have a big change in life. Now, secondly, discipline. Anybody who is consistently great at what they do, 
become the way they are because they were simply more disciplined than anybody else, right? And discipline is in our control, right? I mean, you can ask God for help uh, if, if you're not able to time it up, if you're not able to live according to what you want to do. Thirdly, the foundation for continuously learning is also staying curiosity, right? I mean, a lot of us think that curiosity is a trait that comes naturally for some people by birth, and maybe we are not curious and so on, but curiosity can also be developed, right? I mean, if you, if you start to uh, read about something slowly and then start to read more about it and start to read a little bit more about it, you will eventually develop an interest, right? Now, what I'm saying is that at workplace these days, whatever we do, you know, whatever technology that we used last year may be absolutely irrelevant the next year, right? You know, it is an important thing that we need to know continuously learn. What I do for learning anything new is I always try to do two things. One is that if I have to learn something new, you know, let's say programming language, I would go and register for the exam, era certified so and so, right? Or if you want to, let's say, you know, for example, let's say if you want to learn project management, I would say register for PMP, right? Or if you want to learn about, so basically you are registering for an exam. Because you know, in Indian education system, once you have an exam, you also study, right? If you say that I will watch YouTube video later, I will do an online course and so on, it may not end, you know, come to a fruitful end. Secondly, what I also do is that I always register to be a trainer for the topic four or five months later. I will say, okay, I will teach this subject, which means you're under pressure to learn it properly, right? So these two things have really, really helped me continuously learn, and I always do that. I mean, you know, for example, uh, uh, like, I remember, you know, when we got married, uh, when we used to go, you know, like, I mean, like, like I work for a German company, so we used to go. So I used to know few words in German, only few words. And my wife, Viveka, used to say that when we come back, uh, you know, to my mom, she would say, oh, Ratna speaks so good German. I used to tell her that I don't know anything. You are just saying that because you don't know what I'm speaking. And later, my, you know, she went on to learn you know, the highest level, C2. Now, when we go now, when I speak, she says, why are you pronouncing it wrongly? Why are you using the grammar wrongly, right? So what I'm trying to say is that I did not learn it. So in the lockdown time, what we said is that, okay, if you have to learn the language properly, why don't you take the exam, right? So finally, we registered for the exam. Then I had to study properly, right? So what I'm trying to say is that it could be a hobby, learning a new language and so on, but then when you do it with a goal, you do it much better, right? So all I'm saying, it could be the same for a, you want to learn Java, you want to learn C hash, whatever programming language, or let's say in your own profession, maybe you want to learn something else. You are a finance profession, you want to learn about something else, which is happening in the FinTech industry. Always learn continuously. Lastly, I just wanted to say, uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, that I will show you a still more excellent way than I, you know, I hope all of you know. And then he went to 1 Corinthians 13, right? All of you know about 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long. It's read in most of the weddings. You know, we read that in many places. But at workplace, we need to ask, do I suffer long? Am I kind? Am I envious? Am I puffed up? Do I behave rudely? Do I seek my own? Do I rejoice in iniquity or do I rejoice in truth? Do I believe in all things? Do I endure all things, right? I mean, if you ask that in our workplace, right? Now, I have seen one thing that, you know, many a times, especially to your subordinates. In, in office, we always be very good to our bosses, but to subordinates, sometimes, you know, a lot of us may show what we want to say. But I have learned one thing, even to your subordinates, right? The moment you ask, how can I help you? How can I support you? What can I do for you, right? The entire culture of your team changes, the entire environment changes, right? More than saying, do this, you know, you know, uh, and, you know mo moving from being a command and control approach, you know, being in a, how can we serve and how can we really give? And when we do that, the, you can really be, make a big impact. Now, I want to mention a lot of us also you know, want to grow, want to be important. But one of the, again, important thing from the Bible is that to grow, you need to also know how to give, 
right? So in your company, wherever you are, right? I mean, find out ways to help other people, right? If you are experienced, you can be a mentor, right? For the young people, you can look for a mentor. But always try to give, you know, without any expectation back, right? I mean, if you are mentoring, mentor people. And I can tell you, this actually makes your trust index go up in the company, right? Because if you're always helping people, right? Anybody wants to, you know, need some help, you are there. You are trying to say, okay, I will see what I can do. I will help you. And you follow it up through, not just say I will help you and not help, but you follow it up through, and I can tell you this can really, really make your trust index go up. And when a new challenges come up, then people automatically will come to you. Hey, you know what? This is coming up. Can you take this up? And I can tell you many a times in my career, right? I have not gone behind that I want this position or I want that position. But God, you know, it is always brought back, right? I mean, someone will say, we want you to do this role. We, want, we think only you want, you know, we wanted you to do this role, right? I mean, that's what God brings when we actually put excellence and diligence into workplace. Now, love can be shown in your words. Uh, primarily, I want to talk about one thing. In workplace, we show our words more than talking. We also respond by emails and so on. You know, never, ever be rude with your, what you write, right? I mean, I think, that, like, for example, when a mail is sent, where somebody just annoys me, what I always do is that I write a reply and send it to myself, right? And if you look at it 24 hours back, by then God would have cooled you down and God would have given you wisdom to deal with that person, right? So a lot of times I want to say, you know, love can be, and love is an excellent way and we need to show that in our workplace, right? Lastly, I just want to say one thing because this is important aspect. We need to honor authority at workplace, right? Uh, Colossians 3, 22 to 24 says that God is our boss and earthly bosses are not the ones we are trying to please, right? Uh, when it comes to boss, I've had so many different bosses, right? Uh, I think I've had 16 or 17 bosses because, you know, sometimes there is a change in the organization strategy. You move from one team to other team and so on. But what I always do two things for bosses is that one is that I will always pray for my boss. Second is that I will never, ever talk anything bad about my boss, right? If I have a problem, I will go to my boss and then say, why I want to say whatever I want to say, and then I will tell my priorities, my values, my, you know, what I think we should be doing. And I can tell you, most of these bosses who I had are even today my friends, right? Because Bible clearly says that we need to not please, you know, I mean, not please only the earthly masters as people pleasers, but do everything with sincerity of heart and fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, right? And other thing is also that, you know, it's always important to be polite, right? Be gentle, be kind at workplace. You know, as Christians, we should not be rebellious at workplace, right? I mean, there are ways to handle things. I mean, we can approach the right channel if there is a problem and so on. But then it is very important that we need to be the one who is setting the standards when it comes to being kind, being, you know, uh, uh, polite, being gentle, and also, uh, you know, pursuing peace and so on. So in summary, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, we can overcome any personal challenge that we may have at workplace, you know, with the help of God's word. And God is interested in you overcoming any challenge that you may have. Secondly, be aware of your identity as God's child. You are not a profession. You are not whatever world may call, but we are a child of God. And when we have that, we are secure in anything what we want to do. Secondly, right, develop diligence and practice excellence. And I can tell you that, can, that will surely, surely take you, you know, to many places. Yeah? So I hope uh, what I shared is, uh, you know, is useful. And thank you again uh, for the opportunity. And God bless you. See you again soon.